are going to take a look at Psalm 104. So if you would please open your Bible to Psalm 104. I want to read it for us to set it in our minds and then we're going to go back and make a couple of observations about this most incredible psalm. Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the chambers of his upper, he lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. You who laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever, you covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At your voice, the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. They went up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place which you founded for them. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. He sends the springs into the valleys. They flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them the birds of the heavens have their home. They sing among the branches. He waters the hills from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted, where the birds make their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high hills are for the wild goats. The cliffs are a refuge for the rock badgers. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knows it's going down. You make darkness, and it is night, in which all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. When the sun rises, they gather together and lie down in their dens. Man goes about to his work and to his labor until the evening. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. This great and wide sea, in which are innumerable teeming things, living things both small and great, there the ships sail about. There is that Leviathan which you have made to play there. These all wait for you, that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them they gather in. You open your hand, and they are filled with good. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth, and it trembles. He touches the hills, and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to him. I will be glad in the Lord. May sinners be consumed from the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. That's a song that would have been sung as are the other psalms designed to be sung during worship. And the theme of this song is complementary to the theme of Psalm 103. In Psalm 103, we have a focus on the blessings of God that are spiritual in nature. And in Psalm 104, our focus is on the blessings of God as revealed in his created world. And you put the two of them together and you can give thanks and rejoice for all that God has done. 
spiritually for us, materially for us, his blessings are absolutely incredible. The psalmist in Psalm 104 kind of flips back and forth a little bit between pronouns, doesn't he? Sometimes he talks about you, and he's speaking directly to the Lord and offering praise directly to him. Other times he talks about he and him, and he's talking then about the Lord to those who would be listening. And the, the psalm just flows back and forth as first talking to the Lord and then talking about the Lord. I wonder if maybe that's not on purpose to sort of illustrate to us what our conversations ought to be like during the course of a day. You know, we ought to talk to the Lord about everything that comes along. But we also ought to talk about the Lord as we have opportunity to share with other people what incredible things God is doing in our lives. Now Psalm 104 also illustrates what we uh, theologians call common grace. In Psalm 103, it focused on spiritual blessings. And those are blessings to, unique to those who have come to know Christ as their Savior, who have a right relationship with God. And those blessings are precious and manifold, and we thank God for them. But God also operates in this world in the realm of common grace. Things that God does, the way he administers this universe for the blessing and benefit of mankind in general. And his purpose is, as Paul said there in the, uh, the book of Acts as he was preaching in Athens, the purpose of it is to reveal God to the world so that the world might seek him and be saved. So that they might see the fingerprints of God, as you, as you might say, all over his creation and turn to him for the truth. Providence is a word we don't hear of very often. It's kind of associated with God's common grace, but it expands beyond that. The word providence emphasizes God's control and his administration of things. A lot of times what God does, he does sort of behind the scenes. We talk about the natural laws of the universe, right? And one of the easiest ones to talk about is the law of gravity. You know, what goes up must come down. Uh, it, it works that way. If you let go of an object, it's going to fall. It's attracted to the center of the earth. That's gravity at work. And we call these things natural laws. But who made them? Who determined that it would work that way? That gravity would be a thing that exists, a principle that this world, this universe would be built upon. And by the way, gravity is not just important to this globe. Gravity is what helps to hold the whole universe together. Gravity, that attractional pull of one object on another object, is what keeps the planets in place. It's what keeps the moon in place. All of the varying speeds of movement and different Degrees of gravitational pull from all kinds of different places. That's how God built the universe to operate. And we call that his providential care. God does things that so often look like those natural principles, but it's God at work. And his providence governs the affairs of of this universe. Let's take a look at some of those things. Starting there in verse 2, and I have to look at Psalm 104, not 102, 103. It says, He covers himself with light as with a garment. You know, a lot of Bible uh, expositors have noticed that Psalm 104 has a lot of parallels with the creation account in Genesis chapter 1, and that's true. God covers himself with a garment of light. In fact, the word says that God is light. I wish we understood light. 
I think we would have a lot of understanding of who God is and what He does and how He functions. And we probably understand His holiness and His majesty even more. Do you realize that light's invisible? He said, wait a minute. Look at those lights up there. I can see that light. What you're actually seeing is the reflection of that light. It's not the light itself. You look out into space and most of it is black, right? And yet it's filled with light. We just can't see it. But if you look into space and take an x-ray photograph, you can see all kinds of x-ray spectrum, that part of the light spectrum. If you take an infrared photograph, well, that shows you the light from another part of that EM, or electromagnetic spectrum of light. Our eyes are attuned to see only a tiny fraction of all of the entire spectrum of light, and we probably don't even understand it. We talk about a spectrum which sort of implies that there's an end out there and an end out there, and somewhere along that is the light that we can see. But what if there's no end? God clothes himself in light. And yet, though we cannot see him, we can see the effects that he has produced in this world. Consider your own body, your own hands and feet, your own eyes and ears, and how intricately they are created. Beloved, they couldn't have happened by accident. They couldn't have happened by accident. The eye has to have not only the eyeball, but the iris and all of the, the cornea and all of that stuff and the vitreous humor that's inside and all of the rods and the cones and all of the optic nerve that runs to the brain and the eye without a, a, an optic nerve is no good and an eye and an optic nerve without a brain is no good because the brain has to interpret it. Take one part away Say, one part that took an extra million years to develop, and guess what? You'd have no eye. You'd have no sight. You'd have no seeing. It all had to be there like that. Torque. That doesn't happen by chance, by accident. God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it. He goes on in verse 2. He says, Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. God said, Let the sun, the moon, the stars appear. And there they were, moving in their orbits, doing the very thing that God intended for them to do. And they were doing it instantaneously. God made the sun to rule over the day. He made the moon to rule over the night. The moon has no light source in and of itself. It's all reflected light. Did anybody get to see the lunar eclipse this past Thursday? Yeah, I didn't stay up either. Uh, it looked like... Maybe there would be some spots where the clouds would not obscure it entirely, but I thought, you know what, it doesn't start until like 1 a.m. I'm not going to wait up for it. <laughs> but all of that is functioning according to the way God created the celestial realm. My favorite constellation is appearing now in the night sky. It's Orion. And... and and I can see it in the wintertime, and it's there every year, year after year after year after year after year after year. Why? Because God designed it that way. Maybe you have a different favorite constellation. I don't know. I'm saying goodbye to Cygnus the Swan. That's the Northern Cross. But you know, it's it's kind. Of, but it'll be back. It'll be back next spring, and I'll get to see it again. God arrayed the heavens. It's not. Accidental. It's not by accident. 
Do you understand, beloved, that we, from our vantage point, are inside a gigantic celestial clock? And everything is moving, everything is working as God designed it in the beginning. Verse 3, he lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind. God has designed the weather systems. Now in the early creation, it says there was no rain, that the water used to come up as a mist. Well, oh, isn't that interesting? We'll see that in just a moment. The water would come up as a mist. And there was no rain. Apparently there was like a vapor canopy around the earth. And everything was growing and green and lush and verdant. But when God interrupted that, he already had in place the mechanisms for weather. It was already part of his design. And the winds move around the surface of the earth constantly. And the water, my goodness, the water is drawn up by evaporation from the oceans and it's carried in these clouds. Tons and tons and tons and tons of water are floated. You know, and you've picked up a couple buckets of water before, right? Wouldn't it be nice if you could just float those to wherever you wanted them to go. That's what God does. Through that process of evaporation, which he designed, millions of tons of water are picked up and floated out across the land, and God drops it down. Now, if I, if I were to drop a million tons of weight on the ground, that would make a hole, wouldn't it? How does God do it? With raindrops with raindrops, so that the earth isn't destroyed, so that the, the leaves of the trees aren't bashed down into the mud. Oh, sure, I know, there are storms that come and violent storms that do significant damage, and we understand that, and there are reasons for that. God built all of that into the system, but for the most part, the rains come and they nourish the earth, and even the violent storms still provide water. They still provide nourishment for the earth. God is at work in all of these things. Let's keep going. He says, you laid the foundations of the earth, verse 5, so that it should not be moved forever. You covered it with a deep as with a garment. Remember in Genesis chapter 1? Light was not the first thing that God created. That was the first thing that he did in forming and filling the earth. We don't have an account of God forming the ball and the water around it. That's already there, isn't it, in Genesis chapter 1 when it appears and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. It says that the earth, the King James says, was without form and void. Probably a better translation would be unformed and unfilled. And the next seven days or six days of active creation, a seventh day of rest, God forms it and fills it. And what does he do? He separates waters from waters. He creates an atmosphere. He calls the dry land into being and the waters recede and he sets boundaries for those things. And he establishes all that that globe because he's going to put his crowning achievement of creation there on that globe. This world is created by God as the platform upon which God displays his incredible power and might and goodness and strength and all of his attributes. And we, you and I, human beings, are the crowning achievement of that. We're created in God's image. We're the only ones that are. The angels are not created in God's image. Beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea, they're not created in God's image. In fact, God specifically prohibits 
the creation of those beings, those creatures, uh, making them into idols. He specifically prohibits it. They're not image bearers. You and I are image bearers. I'm not sure that I understand all that that means, but I share things in common with God. He possesses them infinitely and in absolute purity. I possess them because they've been given. You possess them because they've been given in finite, in a finite form. And even what God has given to us in finite form has been marred now by sin. But we are still image bearers. And God redeems his image bearers. All that he's doing in this world is for his glory and for our good. That's, that's amazing. Look at verse... Um, oh, let's look over here at verse 10. He sends the springs into the valleys. They flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them the birds of the heavens have their home. They sing among the branches. He waters the hills from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. God not only is concerned about humanity, he's concerned about all of his creation. He takes care of the birds. What was it Jesus said? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil, they don't spin. But I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory wasn't as great as one of these. Think about the birds of the air. <coughs> the, the lilies of the field are one thing, but what about the birds of the air? They don't toil, they don't sow seeds, they don't gather into barns, they're not out doing a harvest, but God feeds them. Every time I pull up to the uh, one parking area there at uh, Aldi in town, I notice all those bushes with the red berries. That's God providing for the birds. They're right there. Beautiful in color and just, you know, it, it's pleasing to our eye, but God's feeding the birds. And you just thought it was a bush. <laughs> it's God's feeding trough for the birds and for other animals. God provides. That's his providential care. He has in innumerable ways made provision for his creatures. <coughs> whether they're small, whether they're large, whether they're animals or birds or fish, whether they're human beings. This is amazing. Look at this. Verse 14, he causes the, cattle, the grass to grow for the cattle, vegetation for the service of man, that he may bring forth food from the earth, wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which, are, which strengthens man's heart. Those were the three things in the ancient Near East that were considered to be the vital necessities of life. The vital necessities of life. God provides them. What was it Jesus taught us to pray? Give us today our daily bread. No, he's not talking about that loaf of bread that you bought at the store. He's talking about the necessities of life. Notice also what else God provides. It says in verse 16, The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he planted, where the birds make their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high hills are for the wild goats. The cliffs are a refuge for the rock badgers. What do we need? Well, if you're a secular psychologist and you're a secularist, you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We need food. We need shelter. Guess what God's providing? He's providing food. He's providing shelter. He's providing everything that we who are alive in his universe need for everyday life. Did we ask him to do that? No. The unbeliever doesn't ask for those things, and when you were an unbeliever, you didn't ask for those things. You just simply accepted them, you enjoyed them, 
you use them for your own purposes, not considering anything about the one who provided them. And yet God, in his mercy and his grace, keeps providing that common grace for mankind. Beloved, maybe you're like me, and you hear people say, Happy Thanksgiving. By the way, this is truly, I guess this is my most favorite holiday. For one, it's not all spoiled by commercialism. And number two, you can't really effectively substitute anything for this holiday. You always give thanks to a person, to a being. I'm not going to thank these timpani for anything. They just sit there. They do nothing. But I might thank Annie for playing them because when she plays them, it draws the sound out of the drum. I, I, I'm thankful for the sound, but I'm thankful for the sound to the person who made the sound, who caused the sound to be produced. You give thanks to a person, not to an inanimate object. Not to a force or something like that. So this Thanksgiving, when people say happy Thanksgiving to you or they say they're thankful for this or for that, say, who are you thankful to? To whom are you giving thanks? <coughs> oh, it's right to thank our parents for the provision that they make for us and Kids, you ought to be doing that. You ought to be thanking mom and dad for taking care of you, for giving you food and clothing and all those things, and respecting them for doing so. You see, the big problem that Paul identifies in Romans chapter 1 is that although everything that was known about God was known by man and, and he had all that knowledge, it says that he suppressed it and was not thankful. <coughs> being unthankful, being an, an ingra expressing ingratitude is a tremendous sin in God's eyes. A tremendous sin. We need to be thankful for what God has provided. We need to be thankful for His common grace, the food that he provides, the shelter he provides. And he does it in a million different ways. For the, the social aspect of life, we need each other. If we're in isolation, we'll go crazy, truly. Some of us know that firsthand from this past year and a half. You isolate people and they die. God provides all of the things that we need for life, and we need to be thankful to Him, a person, a being, God Himself, far greater, far above us, far beyond our full comprehension, and yet we can give Him thanks and praise for what He has done. The psalm begins with an invitation to praise. Bless the Lord, O my soul. It's personal, isn't it? My soul. I'm not asking you to bless God on my behalf. I'm saying to me, bless the Lord, O my soul. When was the last time you said thank you to God? I mean, really thanked Him. Stop and thought about God's provision and care for you and said, God, thank you. You don't owe it to me. And I didn't even ask you for it. And you've provided. Of course, as a believer, we have the privilege, don't we, of coming into his presence and pouring out our heart and asking for those things that we need. And God provides them. And he takes great delight in doing that for his children. What a precious privilege. That's what Psalm 103 is about. But Psalm 104, this is a psalm for every person. Believer 
or unbeliever. To recognize that God is in heaven. God is on his throne. God is providentially caring for all of the creatures in his universe. And that knowledge alone should cause everyone to give thanks to God. But not everyone will. And so that's why we see in that 34, 35th verse, the psalmist says this, May sinners be consumed from the earth, and the wicked be no more. Why? Because they just ignored God. They accepted all of his benefits and never said thank you. Don't let that be your case, beloved. Don't be willing to accept the blessings and benefits of God and refuse to say thank you. And don't just limit it to one day a year. Make it every day. That's why the psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your incredible provision. And we've, we've skipped verses, we've barely scratched the surface, and yet it's all there for us. Father, I pray that you will awaken our hearts and our minds and open our eyes that we might see you far more clearly and that our hearts would thrill as we look just at the physical created universe and see your hands all over it. And then, Father, when we even consider those spiritual blessings which you have given to us that we haven't even considered this morning, Lord, our hearts should just overflow with gratitude and joy and amazement. Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing for us. Thank you for caring and for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus, to open that way to eternal life. Father, I pray that if anybody's here this morning that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that they will turn to Him and be saved. That they will not only be able to enjoy your providential blessings, your common grace, but Lord, through faith in Jesus, they will enjoy those spiritual blessings that will have eternal reward. Thank you. And we pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.